Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Books and Books, right here in the cultural heart of Coral Gables, Florida. We're very happy to have you with us this evening. While you are silencing your cell phones, um, I show you our Books and Books newsletter. This will give you a rundown of all the great events we have here at Books and Books every night of the week. This will be on the counter, of course, when you're buying your book uh, by uh, Tom Rockman this evening. Um, We've got so many events happening here, there's very, uh, it's not even worth mentioning all of them, but uh, there's usually something for everyone. We've got Spanish events, we've got kids events, uh, many of them being live streamed through the internet, as you can see by the uh, lights and cameras here in the store. Um, I encourage you to take a copy of this, or you can go online and give us your email address, and we can send you all the information you'll ever need so you don't miss a thing. And while we love to have you here in the store, you don't need to be, of course, if you prefer to watch online, you can call the store at the number on your screen while the event is in progress. You can either ask a question of the author or order a signed copy of the book anytime during the event. We can hold it for you here at the store or ship it to you free of charge anywhere in the United States. Uh, but tonight we are very happy to have with us uh, Tom Rockman and his new novel, The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers. But it gives me pleasure to introduce our guest introducer this evening, uh, my colleague here at the bookstore, a good friend, an author and poet in his own right. Please give your warmest books and books welcome to Mr. Victor Santiago. Thank you, Steve. It's a little surreal to be introduced by my manager as the guest introducer. Um, I am not even scheduled to work tonight, but I would not have missed this event for Tom Rockman presenting Rise and Fall of Great Powers. Uh, I first met Tom in January of 2011 when he was here to present This Baby, The Imperfectionists. This was his debut novel, and uh, it got fantastic reviews from everybody everywhere. I was a big fan of this book. It was one of my staff recommendations. I've been happily selling it for a few years now and waiting to see what Tom would do next. And sure enough, one day in the back room of Books and Books, this thing arrived. This is the advanced reader's copy of, Imp of Rise and Fall of Great Powers. One of the great perks of working at a bookstore is that the publishers send these out uh, before the public sees them. We get our hands on them first. Uh, took it home, rushed through it. Not only did Tom not let me down, which I knew he wouldn't, but I loved this book very much. Uh, not going to tell you too much about it. It takes place in three different eras. It follows uh, our heroine at three different ages in her life. Uh, he pulls off the admirable magic trick of making you believe implicitly that the young girl, the young lady, and the adult are absolutely the same person. Um, not only is it full of great characters and beautiful writing, but there's a mystery at the heart of this novel which keeps you turning the page all the way throughout. Uh, I'm very intrigued to see what passage Tom is going to read tonight. Uh, you guys are in for a treat. Please welcome to the microphone, Mr. Tom Rockman. Is I mic'd up here? Um, hello, and uh, hi, thank you very much for coming tonight. Um, it's great, you came to a book event. Uh, what? Okay. Um, no, it's lovely that you came to a book event uh, these days with sort of endless number of potential digital entertainments pinging and flipping and streaming all around you that you chose to come here to a quiet bookish event is really heartening. Um, but I should probably warn you that uh, this object that I'm going to be talking about and trying to interest you in, um, it, it doesn't connect to the internet. Uh, has no apps whatsoever, this thing. Um, and I've looked, but I, I, have, I don't find any buttons whatsoever. But on, on the upside, um, I've left one of these things for, for days at a time without charging it, and it actually works pretty well. Um, so anyway, I'm on this book tour right now. This is about midway through the whole thing. I, I think I've got 10 cities, so I've lost track. I probably should keep track. I'm five, I think uh, this is the fifth one. And a book tour is a, is a really rather strange sort of experience for a writer because you spend all this time laboring away at your, your, what you hope is going to be um, a masterpiece or at least not totally embarrassing for you and your family. And you, you work on this for years and then the publication date nears and, 
And you, you start to get a little bit uh, antsy about it. With all of the books in the world, uh, who's going to even notice mine? And I really hope that the publishers send me on a, on a book tour. And if they didn't send me on a book tour, it would be a catastrophe. And then they send you on a book tour, and you think, oh my god, it's a catastrophe. I have to go on a book tour. Um, because the, I think that, that many of those people who, who end up as writers, not all by any means, but many of them are not necessarily the sort of extroverted, charismatic types who you would notice talking loudest at a party. They might be people who try to get a word in edgewise at a party, but nobody really pays much attention. And so they end up saving those words, going home and composing them and trying to find just the exact right careful way to, to say what they want to say. And, um, and they, then all of a sudden, their book comes out and they have to convert themselves into somebody who, who's going who's to uh, tromp around and, and sort of entertain based on their book. So it's, a, it's a, a tricky thing. And one of the most fundamental parts of it is to be able to say what your book is about, which, strangely, I find to be one of the hardest things to do. Um, you know that you've, again, you've, you've got this big sprawling idea that you've put down and you somehow have to, have to condense it into, into just a couple of sentences somehow. But it is part of the gig, so I will, I will do my best to do so. So The Rise and Fall of Great Powers is a book about a bookseller. Her name is Tuli Zilberberg. And she owns this dusty little store in the Welsh countryside where she is surrounded, as we are now, by thousands of books. But unlike now, she has absolutely no customers anywhere. She's there on her own, and, and this doesn't bother her too terribly because when people come in, they often will want to chat. And chatting means asking her questions about her life, and that brings up her past, which is something that she's not altogether comfortable talking about. She was raised all around the world and moved from one country to another by a peculiar group of adults who looked after her reasonably well. They, they taught her and they fed her. But then, quite suddenly, they all just disappeared from her life. And in the years since, she's had no contact with any, any of them, has no idea where they are, and has no understanding, really, of what it was that was going on in her past, and has given up trying to understand. Until a message reaches her at the store. And Tuli, who is this lifelong reader of books, finds herself trying to piece together the book, or the story, really, of, of her own life. As was, as was mentioned earlier, the, the, um, the book takes place in three different time periods. There are parts that are in 1988, there are parts that are in around the year 2000, there are other parts that are around the present. But it's not told, it's not told chronologically. In fact, it starts when she's in her 30s in the modern, modern day, and then the next chapter she's in her 20s around in 1999, and the chapter after that, it's 1988, and she's nine years old. And it continues in that way. Um, slicing between these different aspects of her life. Well, in the background, you have in the 1988 sections, you have the end of the, the Cold War, the fall of the Soviet Union going on as a distant backdrop. And then in the year 2000, around that point, you have the, the rise and dominance of US power. And then after that, all of the wobbles that followed and up to the, the present day with the, the technological revolutions going on all over the place. So that so it, it's, it's, a, a, it's a novel about one life, but it's also a novel about the times. And that, in short, is what the book is about. But when I'm out on, on a tour like this, and occasionally, very occasionally, a journalist wants to ask a question about the book, wants to, wants to talk to you about, about fiction, which doesn't happen as much as fiction writers would like it to. But when they do, um, invariably the question is, or one of the questions is, so. When did this idea, you know, how did you get this idea? When did the idea come to you? And um, that is simultaneously a, a great question and the most irritating question that you can possibly get. So to, uh, the reason why it's a great question is because it's a fascinating idea, really. It's, it's a question of where, where, where creations do come from, whether it's music, painting, whatever it is. There, is, a, there, is a, a, there must be a starting point for all of this. And where does it come from? Where do the great works of art, not that this is one, but where do the great works of art, where do even bad works of art come from? Where do those ideas spring from out of nowhere, out of our heads? It's, it is a fascinating idea. But it's rather irritating for the reason that writing a novel takes a long time. And you don't feel, looking back on it, typically, that there was one moment when 400 pages of text appeared in your head. And then it was just a bit of a drag to have to type it all out. But it's actually fortunate it doesn't work that way, because if, if it were that way, it would probably end up being a terribly 
dull book because you would be bored with doing all the details. And in fact, part of the, the excitement uh, of the creation transmits itself into the text itself if you find yourself drawn in and curious and slightly uncertain about how this is all going to turn out. So having said all that about how there is no initiating instant, there was an initiating image with this particular novel for me, which was um, an image that came to me all of a sudden. I don't really know why. I don't even remember exactly when, but it was a very sharp picture that, that, uh, that I think guided me through the early stages of the book. And it was as follows. A small child is led by the hand into a room, and the door closes after her. The person who has led her in has gone. And in that room, there are two adults who aren't very interested in her. They're getting on with their own things, and she sits in a corner waiting. Time passes, hours, and more hours, and it becomes increasingly clear that the person who left her there isn't coming back, and neither is anybody else. She has to figure out quite how to ingratiate herself or befriend these, these strangers, and they have to figure out what on earth to do with this kid. So I had this sharp, strange image come to me, and I found myself wondering how on earth this child had ended up there, what on earth would happen to her afterwards, and that really formed the seed from which the entire book grew, that it wrapped up all sorts of other things over the three or so years that I wrote it. But that was the beginning point. And I had then to figure out quite what the story would be. So I sat down and I, I wrote a draft. And it took almost a year of writing out the whole story. And I finally had that, that exciting point where I, I went back. Because as I go along, I, don't read I never turn back and look at it. I just type and keep going. I went back to read it. And it was, it was abysmal, terrible. <laughs> uh, so that was ever so slightly discouraging. I had spent a year doing it, and I thought, well, I've, in, I've invested a year. I guess I better, I better force myself to do this again. And I, I don't think that, there's, that it's, it's, it works well enough for me to revise. So I'm just going to go back and start all, all over again. It was a bitter pill to swallow, but I did it. So I went back, and, I, and then I did the, the second draft and had the nervous moment of going to read it. And, and this one was terrible, too. I had now spent two years on this project. It was closer to, to what I had intended, but it still wasn't right. And I started to feel a bit like, I don't know if you've seen that Marx Brothers movie, the, um, A Night at the Opera. There's this, <laughs> there's this great scene where they are, um, they, are, they are trying to masquerade as pioneering aviators who have crossed the, the ocean. And, and they're, they're asked to explain how they manage this extraordinary feat. And one of them, I think it's Chico, says, well, the situation was this. The very first, on our first attempt, we set out and we got halfway over the ocean and then we ran out of fuel. And so we turned back. <laughs> on the second attempt, we put twice as much fuel in. We set out over the ocean. This time, we were just about to land. We were about three feet away, out of fuel again. We had to go back. Now, the third time, we put plenty of fuel in. We set out over the ocean and then halfway across, we realized we forgot the plane. And so... <laughs> So, so um, that was, that was I, I felt more or less uh, uh, like that, but without any of the humorous aspects of it, that I was midway across and I just had to keep going. And so I was determined to do so, and I did so. And I, I did a, a third draft, and this was now almost uh, three years, that, no, about two and a half years I had spent now just doing this thing. And you can imagine the, the, how apprehensive I was when I went to, to look at that text. And um, to my relief, uh, it, was, it, was, it was what I wanted. It wasn't a finished book, of course, but this was the story that I had intended, and I really felt right. There was one thing that I had yet to do, which I had been looking forward to all the way through, and finally I could do it, which is chop it all up. Because the structure, as, as I've explained earlier, is, is not chronological, but I wrote it chronologically, knowing always that I would be dividing it up. And at that stage, it was, it was great fun to then polish it and ensure that each of the sections worked and that the connections between these different bits um, had the effect that I want. The effect that I wanted was to, to, to try to stimulate some thought about the kind of changes that go on in a person over the course of a life that in the increments that we live them are so hard to detect but are so sharp over longer periods of time. And it, it can really, in effect, your several, your many different people over the course of the life, over, over the course of your life, but feel that you're a continuous self when it's not quite that way. And I enjoyed being able to juxtapose them in this way in order to bring out that effect, while simultaneously doing something um, quite like that with the times that we're in. I wanted to, to be able to 
observe a little bit the period we're in now by talking about the past quarter century, by taking these very key moments in our, in our present history and juxtaposing them all the way through so that we would be, so the reader would be stimulated to, to think about, about how we've gotten here, all that we've gained, and the, some of the things that we've lost as well. So with all of this, this, um, this, this swirl of time and place and these, these scenes that are set all around the world, there is, however, one continuous anchor through the whole um, novel, and that is books. Books themselves represent, for many of these characters, who are characters who feel somewhat isolated. They're not quite certain which the different country they're living in they identify with, where they should fit. And um, I instead, they, they, several of them find a sort of companionship and company in the books that they collect, that they read. And find even a source of, of, of friends among those whom they'll never meet, who may not speak the same language with them, who may not even share a century with them. They nonetheless feel an extraordinary sense of communion with the ideas and people that they find in books. And so I guess that, that given all of that, and that we're in a bookshop, and that the book starts in a bookshop, I will start there with a reading from, from the bookshop itself, right at the beginning. And, um, and this is this is uh, where this is the bookshop that, that Tuli owns, the main character Tuli owns, and that she runs with the help, actually not with much help, he's pretty <laughs> useless, of, uh, of her assistant whose name is Fogg. His pencil wavered above the sales ledger, dipping toward the page as his statements increased in vigor. The pencil tip skimming the pad then pulling up like a stunt plane, only to plunge at moments of emphasis, producing a constellation of increasingly blunt dots around the lone entry for that morning, the sale of one used copy of Land Snails of Britain by A.G. Brunt Capel, price £3.50. Now, take, take the French Revolution, he called out from the front of the bookshop. Now, the French see it completely differently than we do. I, they aren't taught it was all this chaos and reign of terror. For them, it was a good thing. I mean, you can't, can't blame them. I mean, knocking down the Bastille, a declaration of rights. The thrust of Fogg's argument was that when considering the French people and their rebellious spirit, well, it wasn't clear what Fogg intended to say. He was a man who formed opinions as he spoke them, or perhaps afterward, requiring him to ramble at length to grasp what he believed. This made speech an act of discovery for him. But others did not necessarily share that view. His voice resounded between bookcases, down the three steps at the rear of the shop where his employer, Tully Zilberberg, in tweed blazer, muddy jeans, rubber boots, was trying to read. Mm-hmm, she responded, a battered paperback open on her lap. Now, she could have asked Fogg to shush, and he would have obliged. But he reveled in pronouncing on grand issues, like the man of consequence he most certainly was not. It endeared Fogg to her, especially since his oration masked considerable self-doubt. Whenever she challenged him, he folded immediately. Ah, poor Fogg. Well, her sympathy for the man qualified him to chatter, but it did make reading absolutely impossible. Because after all, the fellow who invented the guillotine was a man of medicine, he continued, restoring books to the shelves riffling their pages to kick forth the old paper aroma, which he inhaled before pushing each volume flush into its slot. Down the three creaking steps he came, passing under the sign, History, Nature, Poetry, Military, Ballet, to the sunken den known as the Snug. Now, the bookshop had been a pub before, and the Snug was where rain-drenched drinkers once hung their socks by the hearth. Now bricked up, but still flanked with tongs and bellows, festooned with little green and red Welsh flags and Toby jugs on hooks. An oak table contained photographic volumes on the region, while the walls were lined with shelves of poetry and a disintegrating hardcover series of Shakespeare whose red spines had so faded that to distinguish King Lear from Macbeth required much scrutiny. Either of these venerable characters, dormant on those overburdened shelves, could at any moment have crashed down into the rocking chair where Tully sat, upon a tartan blanket, which came in handy during winters when the radiators trembled at the task ahead and switched off. She tucked back her short black hair, points curling around unpierced lobes, 
a gray pencil tip poking up behind her ear. The paperback she held before her aimed to discourage Fogg's interruptions, but behind its cover, her cheeks twitched with amusement at the circling man and his palpable exertion at remaining quiet. He strode around the table, hands in his trouser pockets, jingling change. It behooves them to act decisively in Afghanistan, he said. It behooves them to. She lowered the book and looked at him, which caused Fogg to turn away. At 28, he was her junior by only a few years, but the gulf could have been 28 again. He remained a youth in their exchanges, deferential yet soon carried away with fanciful talk. When pontificating, he toyed with a brass magnifying glass, pressed it to his eye socket like a monocle, which produced a monstrous blue eye until he lost courage, lowered the lens, and the eye became small and blinky once more. Whatever the time of day, he appeared as if recently awakened by a fire drill, the hair at the back of his head splayed flat from the pillow, buttons missing midway down his shirt, and others off by an eyelet, so that customers endeavored not to spy the patch of bare chest inadvertently peeking through. His careless fashions were not entirely careless, however, but a marker in the Welsh village of Cargenog that he was distinct in the place of his birth. He was an urban sophisticate, no matter how his location, how his entire life militated against such a role. Tuli smiled. It behooves them. What they have to realize, he proceeded, is that, 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 that we, we don't know even what the opposition is. I mean, my friend's enemy is not my... Tuli stood, the empty chair rocking, and made for the front of the shop. It was late spring, but the clouds over Wales bothered little with seasons. Rain had pelted down all morning, preventing her daily walk into the hills, although she had driven out to the priory nonetheless and sat in her car, enjoying the patter on the roof. Was it drizzling still? She disappeared down an aisle, wending past books of stock. Tuli had such a particular gait, toes touching down first, balls of her feet slowly cushioning the heel to ground. And then when she stopped, her feet splayed, back straightened, chin down, a surveying gaze that warmed when she smiled at him, eyes igniting first, lips not quite parting. She descended the creaking stairs to the snug, sat in her rocking chair, and resumed the paperback. Now the thing I wonder, Fogg said, having trailed after her, ledger pencil flicking in his hand, is whether horse is an acquired taste or if there's something genetic in liking it. She laughed, enjoying this typically foggy and swerve of subject. Though I reckon, he went on, that the French only started eating their mares and their colts and their other horse varieties during the Napoleonic Wars. Because, you know, the Russian campaign was falling to pieces and they were retreating and it was so cold and they had no proper food. So all they really had was these horses and so they ate them. But, but this is where, you see, this is where the French got that habit of nibbling horses. It was also, Tully said, at that moment that the French began eating frogs, which some of the smaller troops had ridden into battle. Uh, how much better life would have been, Fogg, if they'd arrived at the Russian front on marbled beef? Uh, you, you can't actually ride cows, Fogg said earnestly. Cannot be done. There was this boy at my school, Alad. He tried it once and can't be done. As for a battle situation, a cow would be out of the question. What's important to real about, realize about the French is that the background fog calmed her. She had no desire to read more of her book. She knew how that story ended. And that's how this one begins. Okay. I'm very happy to take questions if there are any. Yes? Why Wales? What made you choose that? Um, well, the... Um, other sections of the book are, are the first section, is the, the section that's in 1988, chronologically the first, is set in Asia. The chronologically second part is in New York City, and the third part is in Wales. The reason that I chose each of those is because I wanted Thule to be living this life where she starts out sort of at the edges of the world, which in the 80s Asia was still considered to be, and starts to circle into the center around the year 2000 where she's in New York, which I was living in New York at that time. And I remember the extraordinary sense of triumphalism that, that um, people felt about you know, that, that, um, that this system we have of liberal, democratic, free trade, free market um, ideals really works perfectly and that, that the, the real problem for the West now is just how to transfer these, these ideas to everybody else. And then, of course, Everything that followed afterwards complicated all of that. And I wanted her to be right there at that moment, just on the brink of something else. And then in the present day, she's gone to Wales because that too is this, 
it's another place that is right at the edges where she can stand, um, not in society, but really at its margins, looking in and wondering where, if anywhere, she fits into her own times. And it's also where my mother was born. So. <laughs> Yeah. My question dovetails a little off of hers, which is while I was reading this, uh, knowing that you were a journalist for many years, I was wondering how your travels, either professionally or personally, informed the locations um, in Rise and Fall. I mean, all the Bangkok and things yeah. like that. Did you have personal well, experience in some? Of not those when panels? I was. Not when I was. I mean, the the when I was in New York, I was working as a journalist then, but. But um, the other sections, no. However, the journalism is not totally unrelated insofar as uh, when I was reporting the book, I should say researching it, but I, I use an, an old word, but I, I, went to, um, I went to these places and I found that, that the experience of journalism was tremendously useful because I had had these years of, of interviewing people and taking notes and trying to find telling details that I could used to describe something quickly and and um, and I went about and used that but to a different end I mean I did interview people for all of these sections in order that I I could hopefully capture authentically these periods in these places and took notes on the scenes and all of that and with great pleasure too so the, the journalism didn't inform the choices but it did inform the way that I ended up describing it and writing it all yes why a female protagonist well I guess why not I mean I think that you know I think that um, that that the, the great uh, joy of, of fiction as a reader, I think, is that, that ability to be able to pass out of your own frustrating, maddening head and into other people's lives, other places, other times, all of those things, and be able to, to experience precisely what you never can. Um, and I think that, uh, that it's, it's a very similar sort of drive that, that is in writers, or at least in me, that I'm interested in people who aren't me. I, I hope that I don't write a book that's about me. I'm the most boring person around. It would be a terrible book. But I, I'm very much more interested in other people, other human beings, regardless of their gender. And I think that, that um, if, I were, if one were limited to only writing about types of oneself, it would be, it would be a terrible limitation to, to fiction and, and to all literature. There's so many wonderful books written by women with male protagonists and vice versa that, that, um, that I, I think that for, for whatever reason, there's often this idea now that, that people should write a version of what they are within their own context. But, but I completely disagree. I mean, it's, it's, it's complicated and difficult to write about something that isn't, isn't you. And if it was really alien, that would be much harder. But, but um, what an exciting, thrilling challenge, I think, to, to, to find somebody or something that fascinates you, that, that intrigues you, who intrigues you, and try to think about what it's like to be inside that person. And that's, my, that's, that's what I love to do. Yes? Oh, you already had the question. I did, so I'll wait until somebody else. <laughs> you are so excited about what you do, and you're so right. Of course, I'm an old fogey, but I don't think that these kids really know what it's all about. And I don't think that they will get to be a you if someone doesn't push them into reading. Mm. What would you suggest? I was on the school board for 21 years. Yeah. Well, I think that it's very tricky because I think that the, 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 my, my recollection of being encouraged slash forced to read has always ended badly. I mean, I remember when I was a kid in school and they would say, every book they told me to read, I hate. I mean, all of those books are just the ones that I think, oh, I hate Candide, say. But it's probably a great book, and I just couldn't appreciate it because it was forced on me. So I think that probably the trick would be to find a way to encourage people to read of their own volition. So to, to introduce them to all of the options, to make them seem like a valued proposition rather than a bore, and then let them choose whatever they happen to be interested in. I think that, the, the, for me, by far the most worrying uh, aspect of nowadays is the fact that I think that to read is is not something that human beings do naturally. They do with with the greatest satisfaction and gratification once they've learned that habit. But it does take a while to get into it, unless you're a remarkable little bookworm. Um, but but for most people, it takes a while to get adjusted, and the brain has to learn, of course, to read and so forth. And and I think that while so much of what is going on digitally now is based on words and, and letters and so forth. It's a very, very, um, it's, it's a very, how do I say this? Um, 
it's all based on on very, very short attention span. There's very little concentration, very little requirement that you focus on anything. It's just, it is this kind of explosion of little blips all over the place that tends to um, train people out of prolonged, uh, protracted concentration of the sort that for those who, who do so regularly with books is among the most wonderful experiences possible. But I, I fear that, that um, the habit of it is being lost, not entirely, not in yeah. society wholly, but, but it's, it's not quite as widespread as it was. That's a pity. Well, whoever taught you and inspired you did a great job. I'll thank my parents <laughs> on your behalf. I don't know if you remember me, but I was at your reading when you were here three years ago. Oh, I remember your accent. <laughs> <laughs> yes, most people do. And I was such a huge fan of your book. I, I read the hardcover, and then I was here for the paperback reading. Yeah. And I told everybody that they were one of the biggest treats they were ever going to have. Oh, that's so sweet. And Thank I you. still feel that way. It was such a wonderful book. If you haven't read it, I strongly encourage you to. So when I saw that you had this one coming out, I was so excited. Um, but I miss all the characters from your first one so <laughs> much. So as I, as I delve into this one, do you have any thoughts on how to make that segue? Oh, it's going to be a tough emotional shift for you. Um, no, I, I think that I think that uh, the, what the books the books are different in terms of the the structure. Of course, the previous one being a novel in stories, and this one being a, a novel with at least uh, with a, with a more traditional structure. Insofar as there's one main protagonist, but what it what I suppose what it has in common with the last one is that again I'm I'm juxtaposing different ideas side by side all the way through, like I did with the imperfectionist to a different end, and um, and I think it also tries to engage somewhat with with today you know not too heavily but that in the background there are thoughts about the world that that is that is um whizzing by in the background and occasionally sort of colliding with us um and also i th i fundamentally most of all i i would hope that the characters in this one um are just as interesting and stimulating i hope you find them so thank you hi um, did you consider any other um, well, I, yeah, when, I, when I'm writing, I, I collect all sorts of possible titles because uh, in early stages, I don't even exactly know how the book is going to turn out. And so I throw these things out and, and have a, a page where I compile them all. And, and at a certain point, one or two or three might seem like they're maybe right. And then, then at a certain point, one seems like it must be right. So that's how I felt about this one. But I'll explain what I meant by it since clearly it ha it's an unusual title insofar as it sounds like nonfiction, a point that my editors made rather forcefully to me. Um, but um, but the, 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 it has three meanings for me. And one is that the rise and fall of great powers in the sense, on, in the, in the sense of the influences um, that rise and fall over the course of your life, be they ideas or other people. That's one, uh, one of the, the themes in this book. A second one is the, the, the rise and fall of the physical and mental strength powers over the course of life. So in childhood, gaining competency and knowledge about the world. In adulthood, uh, reckoning with the limits of your great powers. And in old age, starting to lose some of those powers. And there are central characters in this book who are each of whom are conf confronting exactly those points of their lives. Um, and finally, I meant by it the, the traditional sense of great powers um, in the sense of empires and political and cultural forces that, that um, sway us all and, and that these characters watch with a, with a degree of, of estrangement often. Um, you mentioned that this came from an original idea you had about the little girl being let into yeah. the room, etc. Uh, I know so many people who would have turn that initial thought into a short story yeah. and then extrapolate it from there. Were you ever tempted to do that or was it no. always? It's, it's, a, it's an interesting question because because you often hear writers saying, I knew it was a short story idea, I knew it was a novel idea. And I mean, I don't claim that I would necessarily know automatically, but this one just felt like there was a lot in it. I felt like like there was there was a lot I wanted to to be able to draw out of this. and and. Also, I think that it, it wasn't an idea that came to me like a whole story, like a completely composed capsule of a story where this happens here and then that's the ending and therefore maybe it could be a short story. It was more like a, an, an intriguing um, beginning of a story that I felt had a lot of potential content, uh, content in it. Yes, please.
I've, I've written two. The previous one is the best, be, by far the best-selling because this came out six days ago. <laughs> so, so the other one came out in 2010. So it's, it's, it's uh, had a few more years, but maybe this one will catch up in time. Thank you. Yes? You were saying when you're writing, you're not sure how it will end up. Mm. When and how do you discover how it will end? By writing it. That's the, I mean, it's, it's a paradox, I know. But, but, um, but I think that you know, I have, I have a, an outline. I have some, some characters. I have some elements of the story. But it's the dropping the one into the other that really activates the whole thing. It's amazing that way that you might write down notes or even just conceive of a particular sort of character. And the same is true for a story. But when you place that character in the story, they start to act, both according to the way that you've defined the character and also sometimes according to mysterious things that pop into your head. You just think they'd say this or that. And then that starts to affect the outcome of the story in ways that are more complex and sometimes different than you had initially planned. And so there's a symbiotic relationship and the thing builds up and builds up, which is why when I looked at that first draft, I knew that it wasn't quite right yet because I knew that I was starting to, to see as if through fog, the, not this fog, through fog with one G, um, the, the outlines of the, the, the story, the novel that I wanted, it was, it, but it didn't have at all the feel that I wanted yet. It didn't have the effect that I wanted. And um, how you can sort of know what that should be before you've even come up with it is, is quite mysterious, but that, that is how it seemed to be. Yes? When you were running out of fuel of rice, then. Yeah. Did you step aside and write other things, or did you stay focused on your efforts? I stayed focused on this. I'm not very good at multitasking, so I, I do one thing at a time and, you know, and keep going until I'm done. So I just went, kept going at it. But um, not at all. I feel, I feel tormented by the thing that's unfinished. Not tempted at all. But, in, but it is a funny thing, though, that does happen or has happened to me. In, in write, not that I've written many books, but in the, the, the two that I've written, um, is that, that toward the end of it, once it's in effect done it, and then it's just a question of revising it and polishing it and ensuring that every sentence is exactly how you want it, et cetera. When you're at that stage, um, and it's a more mechanical and less creative aspect of the process, then I do start to, to come up with fresh ideas. And, and, and the, the tiring and sometimes tiresome um, polishing of the book right at the end, which can go on and on and on, and you want to get it just quite right. In that stage, you start to get annoyed with this person who started this book, who's, who, who supposedly was you, but it feels like a different person at this stage, because you want to write the next book. You've got another idea. And I think that probably if you write many books, then you live in this constant cycle of finishing somebody else's book and dreaming of the next one you're going to do. And so that's, that's sort of where I am now, with the added bonus that I have to speak about that guy's book now. I know, and they can work a lot quicker than, than the novelists. So, anyway, I'm hoping not to deal with that particular issue for a few years yet. But thank you, thank you for raising it. Developing something while you're working on the first thing, you can't resist the attempt to start to flesh out this new idea. Yeah, I, I, yeah, it just doesn't it doesn't quite work that way for me. But um, and I think it would be dangerous if it did, because then I would have too many things on at once, and I could never focus on any single piece of it. I think that's kind of the problem of multitasking altogether. It's sort of a myth, I think. That um, there's a sort of a limited cognitive load that we can take on, and if you just keep, you know, people do seven things. It's not seven things done equally well. It's each done one seventh as well. But that's, yes, please. I know that you live in London, <coughs> and my sense is that. Um, the literary community in London is not as separate as it is here in the United States from theater and film and those communities, probably because of the proximity, mm -hmm. London being much mm -hmm. smaller and we have New York versus LA and that sort of thing. Have you ever given thought to writing in other, other forms, <coughs> uh, screenplays or for the stage or that sort of thing? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I have. I, there are certain things I would maybe like to do if the right situation came about. But um, I, I, my my degree in college was, was actually cinema, and I grew up hoping and expecting to be well, not expecting, but hoping to be a filmmaker. And then it was in university that I started to become really passionate about writing, and less passionate about the movie business. And uh, and I figured that I could um, that that that. Uh, 
hiding myself in, in my study and just working away at my own things was far preferable to trying to get funding and things like that. So I took this, this route, which, was, which, was, um, which suited me much better in the end. Um, however, I'm still interested in film. I'm interested in documentaries. I'm interested in theater and all those things. And if the right situation came up, perhaps. However, I'm also... Um, I'm also cognizant of the fact that they are separate skills and that, that if you don't get really involved in them at a certain point, you can't just you know, become Madonna directing a film or something. I think that you sort of need to be the person who focuses on that. Just if you know, the, I, I have respect for how much work it takes to learn how to write a, a good play. So just being able to do this doesn't mean I could do that. But if somebody's foolish enough to think so, maybe I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Try to write a nonlinear story in a nonlinear form. No. No. I, I like to I like to conceive of them in a nonlinear way, and when I'm writing them, I'll often imagine. I mean, I'm not often. I always imagining this bit is going to go next to that bit. So I write it in a particular way with a particular sort of ending, so that I'm not giving away the, what I shouldn't, and so forth, and that these various bits will link up. So I'm always going backwards and forward among the different parts. But, but um, no, I, I like to do it that way because I, like, I want it to be consistent and solid um, story aside from anything else. And then I can play with it in the ways to have the effect that I want. But I don't want, if I think that if I chopped it up, then it would be easy to start making errors, to start doing things that favor the structure rather than the story. And um, so I like to do it in this order. Yes? Published author change the way you read books now. Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I think I think that it's not so much the the having been published, but I think it's it's spending all of one's time, you know, all of one's working time, uh, focused on that. Yes, it does. It can't help but but change the way that you read. I think that you um, you the, the risk in the worst case is you you read things too technically. And I think you can go through and think, uh, that should have been this clause, should have been there and that, rather than for the story. But on the other hand, when I'm just reading for story, uh, or for when I'm just drawn into it, I know that it's, it's worked. And then I can stop and go back and look at it. And, and there's an additional aesthetic pleasure to, to the technical side of it. So I can go and look at something by, say, Amazing by Virginia Woolf and look at that and just think, uh, just be in awe at that she, how she did this, and then try to figure out not that it can be broken down into, into component parts quite that easily, but to, to nonetheless try to understand how other sorts of writing work. So the, the, the downside is that you can, you can be too analytical, but the, the positive is that that can be interesting. Well, and the closing question is irresistible. You sort of alluded to the fact, book three, idea number three, it's in the works. Yes, it is. Um, yeah, I, I, before setting out on this tour, I wanted to have made a good deal of progress on that, so um, so I have done, and um, <coughs> and as with my first two books, I'm incredibly secretive about what they're about. <laughs> so um, so I I'm I'm afraid I, I don't talk to I mean even my editor and agent don't even know what it's about, but but I can only say that it's going along very well, and when I'm com when I've completed this tour, I can't wait to get back to it. <laughs> Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much. That was great. Uh, folks, uh, the books, of course, are for sale behind the counter out here. You can buy your copy. Tom will sign them for you right here. Or you can, um, if you're watching online, give us a call. We'll get a book signed for you. We'll hold it or we'll ship it to you. Thanks very much for coming. <laughs>
Thank you.